Hi there, it's Kim Coach Powers, and today we're covering some gas laws. This is uh, section 11.2, and our objectives today are to state the gas laws, articulate the relationships between the gas variables, like volume, temperature, and pressure, defined by each law, to apply the gas laws mathematically with these formulas, and to convert between Celsius and Kelvin temperature scales. So when we're done, your criteria for success should be you can explain how the pressure, volume, or temperature of a gas will change if one of these gas variables is manipulated and the other is held constant, okay? So for instance, you could explain how pressure will change if volume increases at constant temperature. And then you can use the gas law equations to solve for pressure, volume, and temperature. So let's start <clears throat> with an overview. So these are our variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and N is the amount in moles, okay? It's basically the number of particles you might have in a particular, um, you know, sample of gas, all right? So you want to be able to state the relationships between each of these. And remember that every one of these gas laws, we're going to give you some initial conditions and then some final conditions. So your job is to say, okay, if these are the initial conditions and I change one little part, then what's the final condition going to be? So that's what you're going to be doing with these. Now, we're going to start with the relationship between volume and pressure, and this is Boyle's Law. Now, Sir Robert Boyle uh, did a lot of different experiments, and he actually was involved in, um, you know, part of the experimentation to get the first hot air balloons up into uh, the air. Uh, so he's kind of got some fun history there. Remember that Boyle's Law is going to relate pressure and volume. Now, each of these different laws, uh, you have to remember their different names, right? Like which scientist goes with which law. And you can come up with your own little way to remember them. Uh, and for whatever reason, Boyle's Law, I've always just been able to imagine uh, a boil on like my arm, like think of like the bubonic plague or something like that. And watching that boil get like bigger and bigger and bigger and have the pressure, uh, you know, go, yeah, 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 just a boil volume, pressure, it always just works for me. So even the relationship isn't necessarily right with regard to the boil or the connection, but it just helps me remember it. So if come up with some way to remember, you know, who boil was and that he's related to pressure and volume. Remember that this is an inverse relationship. So as your volume is decreasing, your pressure is going to be increasing. Okay, you can kind of imagine like a, um, uh, it's a wrench pull my syringe out here real quick. Um, and with that syringe, okay, if I have a particular volume of gas in there, right, and let's say I put my finger over the top, and I am going to decrease that volume, then I'm going to be increasing the pressure, right? And so you can kind of hear that, right? As soon as you put your finger and pull your finger off, you can hear that sound. And you can see that, yeah, I've definitely increased the pressure by decreasing the volume. So it's a real quick and easy uh, way to look at Boyle's law. Now, what is happening according to the kinetic molecular theory? Like, we, we want to try to keep looking at all these different concepts with regard to the KMT, right? So if I am cutting my volume in half, right, from there to there, then what's happening with regard to the kinetic molecular theory. Remember, the, the air has not been able to escape because I'm holding it in. <clears throat> so what's going on? It means all that air has to be colliding in a shorter and a smaller space. And so you're going to have a whole lot more collisions on the sides of the container if you decrease that volume. Okay, for instance, by half, it's going to double the amount of collisions that you have uh, with all those particles that are in there. Okay. So your formula is P1V1 equals P2V2. Remember that you can use different types of units. You can use millimeters of mercury, you can use atmospheres, you can use kilopascals. It doesn't really matter what units you're using as long as you are going to make the same units on the other side, right? So just make sure that you have the same units on both sides and you can use different volumes, different pressures, but they have to be the same on both sides. So let's see how you would solve a problem like this. This is a Boyle's Law problem. Pressure exerted on a 240 mil sample of gas at constant temperature is increased from 0.428 atmospheres to 0.724 atmospheres. What will the final volume of the sample be? All right, so remember that when we do these problems, we always want to show our work, right? So we've got our given here being the V1 is 240 mils. P1, 0.428 atmospheres. P2, 
0.724 atmospheres, and then our unknown, V2. Now remember, we said that you would get um, the initial conditions and that you would have one change, right? And so our change here um, is the P2, right? That's the only thing that we see changed. So we've got a P2 where our pressure has changed in amount. And now we have to solve for our V2 change. What has been the change in our volume when we changed our pressure? So that's very much like what we had here, right? We have 240 mils. So you can imagine like a 240 mil sample. And it says that the pressure is increased from that to that, right? It's at almost doubling. Uh, what's the final volume going to be? So it's got to be smaller. Try to picture these in your mind as you're doing it. So that way, when you come up with your answer, you can check your work and say, hey, was that actually smaller? And so, yeah, um, definitely going to be smaller here. So we write our formula, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. Then we have to manipulate it and change it so that we can solve for V2. And then we just plug it all in and make sure you show your units in your work. And you get 142. Can we keep it in three sig figs? Yes. Remember that if we have a decimal over here at the end of our number with a zero on it, that that decimal is trying to indicate, yeah, we actually measured that zero. So we can keep our answer with three sig figs there, right? So you can just box this answer here and you can be like, yeah, we got it. That's the change in our volume. And again, 142 is smaller than 240. So we got smaller. And again, that makes sense. That's kind of what we want to do is do a little logic trick on that. So let's talk about the relationships because that one was a uh, an inverse relationship. But when we do mathematical formulas and mathematical problems, sometimes it gets a little confusing as to what direct versus inverse. Because remember, we had this formula where we said it was P1V1 is equal to P2V2. And when we think about inverse, a lot of times we're not thinking about these things being multiplied by each other. So I just want to kind of recap that one more time. Imagine these, but let's just put some different numbers in there. Let's say this is two and four, okay? two atmospheres, four liters. Now, if I want to keep these the same because the pressure you know, and volume before has got to be equal to the pressure and volume after, then if I am going to, let's say, decrease my pressure, so my new pressure is now one atmosphere, let's say, then what does my volume have to be to make this whole thing you know, still equal? Well, two times four is eight, Therefore, if I want this whole thing to still be eight, then volume is going to have to go up from a four to an eight, right? So my volume actually had to go up to eight liters in order to make that thing true. And so this is important for you to realize that even though the relationship here is multiplied, that's actually an inverse relationship in this kind of situation. Because as my pressure went down, my volume had to go up. OK, and so that's what you're seeing here. And of course, you would see the opposite. And we'll see this with Charles's law here in a little bit. Uh, we have volume and temperature being direct relationship. As one goes up, the other has to go up in order to stay the same. Um, you can kind of just imagine that if I had a two and a four here and if I moved my two up to a four, then my four has got to move up to an eight. Right. To make sure that they're still equal to each other. And so we use this symbology. We use the K for a constant, meaning that if I have a direct relationship, Dividing my two numbers by each other is actually going to give me a constant value. Whereas if I have a re an inverse relationship, then multiplying my two numbers next to each other is going to give me a constant value. Okay, and so that's what we saw here, right? We're multiplying the P and the V together, and that gives me that constant value. They're both still equal to eight. Um, over here, we had to divide to make them equal to each other, right? One half is still one half. And so inverse relationship, is actually kind of going to look like multiplication, whereas direct relationships actually looks a little bit like division in those situations. All right, so these are a couple more that you could practice. Um, again, trying to solve for a new pressure. Um, and that first problem and that second problem, um, it's going back to Dal Dalton's law of partial pressure. And so we're not going to worry about that now. But if you want some more pro problems, you can definitely practice those. Let's go into volume and temperature. <clears throat> so we have Charles's law here. And this is going to relate the temperature and the volume. Really important, though, to realize that when I'm relating these, that any time I describe temperature, I have to describe it in Kelvin. Okay, These gas laws are all 
true based upon Kelvin temperatures. In fact, some of the ways that we first started looking at these gas laws is kind of theoretically working our way back to what it would look like if we were as cold as we could possibly be. And we kind of came up to this temperature of zero um, in Kelvin because once you got down to, it goes down to zero volume, then you were at zero Kelvin. And so we kind of come up, came up with this whole idea behind Kelvin based upon these gas laws. <clears throat> so again, Charles's law is direct relationship. If temperature is going to increase, the volume is going to increase. But remember, we have to always keep something constant. In this case, we're keeping the pressure constant. <clears throat> and we wanna think about what's happening in the kinetic molecular theory here, right? <clears throat> if the temperature is going to increase, why does the volume increase? Well, you can kind of think of a balloon, right? If I'm going to keep my pressure constant, let's pretend like the balloon has the same elastical, uh, elastic push on it, <clears throat> although it's going to change as it changes. Um, but if I heat up the temperature, then I'm going to be causing those particles, those little gas particles to be colliding more and more and more because they're moving faster and faster. And so if I'm going to maintain the same pressure, it means I have to expand the balloon, right? I have to allow that balloon to expand to maintain pressure uh, at the same level because I've got to have a bigger space for those particles to jam into the sides of the walls, right? To collide into the sides of the walls because they're moving faster. Therefore, I've got to make sure that there's fewer collisions than <laughs> if I kept the volume the same, right? So the volume's got to get bigger so that there's fewer collisions with regard to uh, that speed. All right, so uh, the formula is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over D2, okay? Um, this is the way that I like to uh, show that formula, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. I like to keep my ones and my uh, my ones together and my twos together, okay? Um, some people like to show that formula like that, um, but I just like to keep my ones on the same side. It's more fun for me to say V1, T1, V2, T2. <laughs> All right, so again, what kind of thing are we looking at? We're looking at um, balloons. That's a good example of this relationship. You can kind of imagine yourself, you know, with a, a freezer. Let's say you take a balloon and you put a balloon in the freezer, right? Um, what's going to happen to the balloon in the freezer? It's going to get smaller, okay? You may have seen um, some balloons get put into some liquid nitrogen and they just kind of shrivel up, right? Um, so what's happening in those cases, if you're dropping the temperature, then those particles have suddenly lost their energy because they gave off that extra energy into the sides of the container, which were now really cold. And so now those particles are not moving around nearly as much. In fact, in a balloon with liquid nitrogen, you actually might see that air that you breathed into it by blowing up blue, you actually might see it turn into a liquid. In liquid nitrogen, it's actually cooled so much that it actually turns into a liquid there. Um, and so that is fewer collisions on the balloon wall, and so that balloon shrinks, all right? Then once it warms up again, then those uh, particles start speeding up, and so then they start colliding against the balloon walls, and so the balloon inflates again. So again, we talked about this temperature in Kelvin. Now, this temperature, um, which is what we call absolute zero in Kelvin, is equivalent to negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, okay? So negative 273.15 degrees Celsius is equal to absolute zero. Basically, this is what we call zero Kelvin. Now, Kelvin doesn't have a degree sign on it, okay? Um, you know, if I were to do Celsius, I have to have that degree sign, but notice there's no little degree sign here. We don't put a degree sign with Kelvin. It's a unit like any other unit um, where it has a mathematical relationship, um, and it's the lowest possible temperature that we've been able to achieve. Um, <clears throat> now, I will tell you that, um, it, you know, for these equations, the reason we have to use Kelvin, again, because we can't have these T values that are negative, right? We don't have any ne negative temperature values, and it's not going to work with our gas law calculations. Um, so we got to keep it everything in Kelvin. Don't forget that. Um, I also tell you that, you know, the University of Colorado at Boulder, they actually published a paper where they talked about how theoretically you could get temperatures below zero K. Um, but you know, that paper was like right over my head. It didn't really make sense to me. <laughs> had to do with a uh, Boltzmann distribution, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, it, it was woo, right over my head. So you can read that. It's pretty exciting stuff to see that maybe you could do that. But uh, um, zero Kelvin is the temperature at which all matter is supposed to stop moving, okay? So even like the particles, the solid particles would stop vibrating if you could actually achieve it. Now, nobody's ever been able to get 
down that far, right? Zero Kelvin is the limit. Um, and so they can get to like within millionths of a degree, uh, like 0, 0.00, like, you know, six digits or whatever. So they can get really, really, really cold. But, um, you know, there's always going to be some heat from the environment, from the even from the environment that you're using to measure the temperature from, right? That stuff is all going to have some residual heat where it can have atoms that can, you know, possibly heat up other atoms. So um, we've never been able to achieve absolute zero, but we can get really, really, really cold. And some really interesting things happen to uh, atoms when they get really cold. So here's our formula. K is equal to 273.15 plus the uh, degrees Celsius, whatever you have there. So if I had 100 degrees Celsius, that's boiling, then I'd have 373.15 Kelvin would be my answer there. Now, notice how I have a 0.15 here. Um, and so we're talking about, you know, a conversion factor giving us some significance there. Remember that if I actually gave you a problem and I had 100 degrees Celsius, that your final answer would have to be rounded to 373 Kelvin, right? You wouldn't be able to keep that 0.15 in there if this is all I gave you because I only gave you three sig figs. And so your final answer can only have um, <clears throat> the sig figs based upon the decimal point, right? So not just three sig figs, but where my decimal point is. And so I couldn't include that 0.15 if I'm adding them all together because I don't have a 0.15 over here, okay? Um, anyway, there you go, let's continue on. So Charles Law, let's see if we can solve a problem on our own. Uh, at 27 degrees Celsius, a gas has a volume of six liters. What will the volume be at 150 degrees Celsius when the pressure remains constant? All right, so why don't you go ahead and pause it and practice it and see how you do, and we'll be back here in just a second. Welcome back, let's see what we came up with now. 27 degrees Celsius. So this must be a T1. And the first thing we got to remember is that concept that if we have Celsius, we cannot keep it in Celsius. We've got to convert to Kelvin. So we're going to have to turn this into Kelvin. So we have to add 273.15, right? And so that's going to take us up to 300. And, you know, again, talking about how we add this stuff together, we have 0.15, but can we keep it that way? Right, we're not supposed to keep it to 0.15. Uh, we're supposed to round it to two, but we'll round it at the very end of our problem. That's fine. Uh, we can do it that way, or we could just say 300.2 at this point. Um, our V right has a volume of 6.00 liters, and then it says what's going to happen if we change our temperature to 150 degrees Celsius. Well, that's our T2, right? And so again, we have to convert this to the Kelvin scale. So we're gonna have to add the 273.15, right? So we add those together and we get um, 423.15. Remember, we can only go to that decimal, so that's gonna become a two. And so we're like, all right, well, that's 423.2 Kelvin, right? All right, so now we're looking for our new um, volume, what will the new volume be? Or the second volume here. And we're going to go in liters because we started with liters there. And it says the pressure remains constant, so we don't have to calculate for that. So then we just plug it in after we write our formula. So our formula is V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. We're solving for V2, so we're going to have to multiply both sides by T2. So our new formula is V2 is equal to V1 T2 divided by T1, plug it all in, <clears throat> V1 is 6 point, ooh, that didn't turn out so pretty, 6.00 liters times 423.2K divided by 300.2K. All right, so we plug that into our calculator. 6 times 423.2 divided by 300.2 gives us an answer of 8.458. Okay, so how many sig figs can we have? We can have three because that one had three and we're doing a multiplication problem. That's our least. So we have to say our final answer is 8.46 liters. Okay, that would be the new volume. Does it make sense? Always do these problems and ask if it makes sense. All right, I'm heating it up. Therefore, it makes sense that if I'm heating it up, my volume should expand. It's a direct relationship. Increase one, increase the other. Okay? All right. So, oh, well, there's all the, yeah. 
I like to write it out, but there you go. <laughs> There's all of the the uh, the cooler, nicer writing. <laughs> all right, so <clears throat> let's look at our next one. Now, this one is called Gilas X Law. Now, I've been told uh, in various uh, <laughs> various times that this is Guy Lussac, um, that in French, this is considered uh, the same pronunciation that G-U-I has, but I am not a French-speaking person, so I have no idea if that's true. Um, I'm just passing it on because that's what I was told, and it makes things less awkward. <laughs> okay, so this is a relationship between pressure and temperature, okay? So we have to make sure that we are keeping the volume the same, right? So we're keeping our volume constant this time, and it's a direct relationship, and so as the pressure increases, the temperature is going to increase, okay? Or vice versa, as the temperature increases, the pressure would increase. But again, that's only if you're keeping the volume the same. Now, does that make sense, right? Um, if you have a container and you're heating it up, does the pressure increase? Well, yeah, because those particles are moving faster. And if I'm not allowing the volume to change, like I was with the balloon, if I have a fixed container, then I'm going to have more collisions because the particles are moving faster, right? So this is what happens inside a pressure cooker, right? If you think about what happens inside a pressure cooker and you don't allow the gas to escape, then you're going to end up, as you increase the temperature, you're going to end up increasing the pressure. And this is great because this is what cooks your food faster um, because that pressure is now increasing the vapor pressure, which basically changes your boiling point. And so the energy can just keep rising inside there. The heat that you put in is just going into making the water hotter and hotter and hotter. So that water is going to be above boiling temperature. And that means the food that's in there is going to be cooking at temperatures above boiling temperature, which means they're going to cook faster, right? All right. <clears throat> um, so your equation, P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2 is the way that I like uh, to write that out. Okay. And let's see how that works. Let's see if you can do a problem with that. If a gas in a closed container with a constant volume has an original temperature of 25 degrees Celsius and it's pressurized from 15 to 16 atmospheres, what would the final temperature of the gas be? All right, well, I'm going to let you pause and practice, and then we'll see if you get it right. All right, so go ahead and pause it, and welcome back. <laughs> let's go ahead and see how you did. All right, let's start with our pen actually being a pen. All right, so we've got 25, well, okay, I was going to write it out, but you know what? I'm not going to write it out because it's already done for me, and I wrote it the last one. <laughs> okay, so 25 degrees Celsius, and my pen just did not want to work apparently. It still doesn't want to work. Come on, pen, do your thing. It's not a pen, that's an eraser. Why is it being so bad? Pen, give me, give me the pen. Oh. <laughs> Stylus on the back side. Yeah, it's all user error. It's all you gotta know. It's all about user error. All right, so we got 25 degrees Celsius, but we gotta convert that by adding 273, right? And so we're gonna get to 298 as our temperature in Kelvin. And then we go from 15 atmospheres to 16 atmospheres, right? So P1 was 15, P2 is gonna be 16. We're solving for T2, write out our formula and after we do that, we plug it uh, in. After we rearrange it, we got to solve for T2, right? So let's just do that real quick because some of you guys get a little bit confused when we rewrite the formulas. And so I want to make sure that we're really clear on that. So we're solving for T2, which means that we're going to have to do a couple little steps here. First of all, we have to have, remember, our unit, uh, sorry, our variable in the top and isolated. So we got to get it on the numerator and we got to isolate it. So first of all, let's get it in the numerator. Let's multiply both sides by T2. Boom, boom. Okay. Now we've got to get isolated. Well, that seems like we're doing a lot of extra work, right? But you just got to do it. And so you've got to divide both sides by P1 and you've got to multiply both sides by T1, right? So that way the P1s cancel and the T1s cancel. So whatever I do to one side of the equation, I do to the other side of the equation. So by the time I'm done, I get that T2 is equal to P2 times T1 over P1. All right, you see that there? It's hiding in there. <laughs> All right, and that's what we have here, right? P2 over T1, uh, P2 times T1 equals, uh, ah, divided by P1 is equal to T2. All right, so that's the formula we plug it in. All right, so let me erase all that stuff I wrote down there and we'll forward through. So now we go ahead and plug those values in and we end up with 318 
okay, right? Uh, because we're doing a division, we can have three sig figs because those two have three sig figs, right? So there's your answer. Make sure you box your answers when you're done. All right. Now let's do the combined gas law. The combined gas law basically is one in which we're going to combine all of our laws together. The Boyle's law, the Charles law, and the Gillespie's law. We take the pressure, temperature, and volume, and we put them all uh, together. Okay. So if none of them are constant, if neither pressure, temperature, nor volume are constant, then we can use the combined gas law and see how they're all related to each other. So here's your formula: P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. Again, I like to keep everything on the same side, the ones on one side and the twos on the other side. The other three relationships are all going to be able to be derived from that one, okay? And anything that you have that's constant, it's going to be dropping out. Um, so in other words, if you wanted to use the combined gas law anytime you want, you can. And you don't have to use a separate law, right? You could always use combined gas law. You would just say, oh, is volume constant? Okay, well, then I'm just ignoring volume. And then the rest of that is going to be what you're going to solve, right? So um, this is a law which is nice because you can use this at any time if you want. All right, well, let's see how we would do it. It's just a little bit more work. We've got to plug all this, all these values in, all right? So now we've got the temperature, we've got the pressure, and we've got the volume that we have to deal with. Um, we've got our temperature. First thing we need to see is that that's in Celsius. We're going to have to convert, right? Our volumes are okay. They're in milliliters, so they're both in milliliters. So we can keep them that way. Atmospheres is the pressure we're looking for. It looks like we want to find out the original pressure. Now, that's kind of interesting because we haven't done this yet. We have to solve for original pressure which is P1 that we're solving for instead of P2, for instance, uh, the change in pressure. <clears throat> we want to see what was it in the beginning. Um, and so the equation is kind of sounding backwards, but it's exactly the same thing. You just got to plug stuff in and it's not difficult at all. So you just write out your givens, make sure you identify your temperature one is 40 degrees Celsius. Why? Because a sample of oxygen at 40 occupies this much. So if this is our T1, that's going to be our V1, right? says later occupies, that must mean that's our V2, and then that's our T2. But again, we got to convert these to Kelvin, right? And it says that later occupies the two atmospheres. So that's going to be your um, P2 right there. All right. So then you plug all those values in. Again, it's a little bit more work, a few more things to do. But once you start with your equation, you're like, okay, what do I have to solve for? I already decided I had to solve for P1. So then I have to just isolate P1, and how do I do that? By dividing by the V1 and multiplying by the T1, right? So if you do that to both sides and you divide by the V1, multiply by the T1, then you're going to get your answer. Your new equation is going to look like that. Get some of those guys out of the way so that you can see it. And then you just plug everything in, just like all the other formulas we've been doing. Okay, got to show the full gems here. But once you plug all that in, after you've converted everything to Kelvin, then you're going to get 2.9 atmospheres as your answer. Did you get it right? Well, if you did, you're amazing. And you are amazing. So good deal. All right. Can we identify and apply the correct gas law to the following problem? So we have to look at this. And again, how do you identify these gas laws? Well, look at what you've been given. You've been given volume, right? You've been given temperature. All right. So you just have to like, well, that's volume and temperature that I've been given. And so what formula deals with volume and temperature? And again, you've memorized these. I don't know how you decided to memorize it, but you came up with some method by which to memorize Charles's law, right? And so you're like, oh, that's Charles's law because that's the one that has to do with volume and temperature. And uh, now, can you solve for it? Well, of course, but you're not going to forget to do this, are you? You're not going to convert, uh, forget to convert your Celsius to Kelvin before you actually do that, right? Um, because that's going to be your key. All right. Well, um, you don't really need to see me do that problem. I think you guys have got a good feel for it. You want to see it, don't you? I know you do. Yeah. Okay. All right. You want to see it. So let's just do it just to make sure. You're like, I just want to know for sure. Did I get it right? So <laughs> you've got volume one is equal to 250 mils, right? And then you've got temperature one, 25 degrees Celsius. We can convert that one. We just did that on the last problem, uh, right? We had the 25. Oops, two problems ago. Let's go back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going back further than I intended to. 298.2. You see it there, right? That was that same... <laughs> 25. So 298.2. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me while I come through. 
All right, so we've got 298.15, or we'll just take it to the 0 0.2, right? Kelvin. And then it says, what volume will it occupy at 95 degrees Celsius? So we've got to convert that one. Um, so we've got to add that 273, right? 0 0.15. 5, 1, 8, 368.15. So we can say, well, that's 368.2 Kelvin. And I'm looking for my V2, baby. Question mark, number of milliliters. And so now I just got to plug it in after I figure out the formula. It says that I'm looking for V2. So that's over on the side. So I can multiply both sides by T2 to get that equation. And so I say, all right, well, my T2 is 368.2K times my V1, which is 250 mils divided by my T1, which is 298.2K. So take that, punch it into your calculator, 368.2 times 250 divided by 298.2, and we get an answer of 308.7. So our answer, I'm just going to squeeze it in here, 308. Kind of forgot the zero. 308.7 milliliters. Box that answer. Do, are we allowed to keep three, four sig figs? Ah, uh, no, we can't keep four sig figs because we've only got three sig figs there. Drat. Woo. All right. So now we're going to have to change that to 309 milliliters is our final answer. Okay. So that's how you do it. I bet you got it right. And remember to follow your sig figs and do all your good stuff there. So that's all we're going to do for today. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoyed learning about the gas laws. And uh, it's fun to, to do some actual experiments on them. We'll do some experiments on those in the class. Okay. So objectives. Let's review them. Can we state the gas laws and articulate the relationship between the gas variables defined by each law? Yeah, right? Boyle's law, Charles' law, Guy Lussac's law. Boyle's law is pressure. Uh, and volume, Charles' law, volume and temperature, gas, uh, Gilles X law is the volume and pressure, and volume and temperature and volume and pressure, both direct relationships, volume and uh, pressure are going to be inverse relationships. So, boom, got them, right? Apply the gas laws mathematically, you now know all three of the, uh, four of those formulas, and you now know the combined gas law as well. So, Four different formulas you need to know and use, including now a fifth formula, <laughs> converting between Celsius and temperature scales. Now, one of the things that we didn't show you, uh, we showed you Kelvin is equal to uh, 273.15 plus your degree Celsius. But remember, Celsius is going to be equal to um, the exact opposite, right? So if I have, I've got to subtract 273, right? Um, and so I'm going to be taking my Kelvin and I'm going to be subtracting the 273 0.15. So, for instance, if I wanted to know what is zero Kelvin, well, zero Kelvin in Celsius is a negative 273.15, right? So, there you go. So, that's the other way, right? So, you had the first way, which we talked about on top, but we didn't actually show you the second way, but I'm pretty sure you guys probably figured that on your own. Okay, let's look at our criteria for success. And so uh, you need to explain how the pressure, volume, or temperature of a gas is going to change if one of those value variables is manipulated and the other is held constant. So again, make sure you can talk about the direct inverse relationships. So pressure and volume are related like that. That's inverse, right? We want to talk about the direct relationship of volume and temperature. As you increase one, you increase the other. And then we want to talk about the relationship between the pressure and the temperature and again, if you increase one, you increase the other, okay? So two direct relationships and one inverse relationship. And again, you can use those gas laws, so you can do what you need to do. And yeah, you're amazing, right? So have an awesome day. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about these gas laws. Uh, God bless, and hey, be kind to one another, because being kind is the way to be. <laughs>